On this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can import existing tracks into Basecamp and then use them as the basis to create new routes. There are some little gotchas you've got to be aware of when you do this. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different uh, types of track I'm going to import. So first of all, we're going to look at um, a, a route that I've done myself using my own sat nav and it's recorded the track. And so we'll import that. And then we'll try one from a third party and um, we'll have a quick look at that. Now, <clears throat> so let's go down and find my Zuma, which is plugged in at the moment, and go to internal storage. Now I'm going to go to uh, tracks. So this is now just showing all of my all of the tracks I've done, all the routes I've done in the past. So this is a log essentially of of journeys I've made. And it, it date it date stamps them quite nicely. It names them in like an ISO date format. So year first, then month, then day, day of the month, and then the time. So it essentially means they appear in you know in order, which is quite nice. Um, I'm going to take this one here, starting 10:03 on the 25th, and we'll end it there. So all I'm doing is I'm selecting. Uh, multi-selecting by left clicking on the first one and then I'm holding down shift it's like any standard Windows stuff holding down shift left click and that selects everything between those two those two points then I'm going to right click on that copy and then we're going to go back to our demo list and paste into there so right click paste I'll just click that back on to show all user data so we've only we've only got tracks in there at the moment anyway, as you can see. Switch between tracks and all user data. Now, so this is this is a this is a set of tracks done on a on one day's ride. Um, if I select them all and show on map, it's going to zoom in on that track, and it it would generally default to this dark grey um, colour. As you can see, it's it splits tracks into little segments as it records them on the GPS unit. That's all well and good, but we actually want them to be all joined together as one track, really. So again, select them all. And if we right click, we get, we've got this option down here, join the selected tracks. So that's what I want to do. I'm going to join them all. Now, if any are for any reason in the wrong order, you can actually click on individual ones and move them up and down before you uh, before you join them all together but that looks fine so we're just going to okay that then it tells us do, do we want to delete the original tracks yes we can delete the original tracks because we've created the new one which is all of them combined together it won't delete them from the gps unit in this case okay so it's going to keep those so we can get rid of those original tracks we don't really need those anymore OK, so it's given it the name track, not especially useful. Let's just double click on that. Now, I got my own convention of using red for historic for tracks. So I use the color red um, for any tracks I do. I use this magenta, which is the default color, I think, for, for new track for new routes. So I use magenta for new routes and I use uh, red for tracks. It just makes it easy to see things in the context of Basecamp. So we've got that as red, and I'm just going to call this um, Cotswold Strip. Oh, Cotswold's right. There we go. OK, so let's close that. And now, so what we're looking at now is, as I say, it's the, it's the route I did a few days ago from, uh, from Coventry down to the Cotswolds. And if we, let's double click on that again. We can look at the points on this trip. So these are the recorded points that the GPS has logged along the route. Occasionally, there's some useful bit of information on these. So each leg between each point, you know, the elevation, the, the leg distance time, the speed uh, for the duration of that leg and the direction and the time and the exact position, exact coordinates. Uh, occasionally there is there is a glitch in, on GPS I've found where occasionally you'll get a ridiculous speed 
Like it'll, it'll jump to 160 miles per hour, something crazy like that. So don't be, don't <laughs> don't be overly concerned if you see something like that. It looks okay on this occasion, but occasionally you do see silly speeds. Um, just while we're here, the graph gives you an idea of elevation over time. Or you can see speed over time, and you can zoom into individual points. So that, that's quite nice to go back and look at things. OK, but what I wanted to do here was just examine these points individually. So if we right click on the point, as you see in one of the videos show on map, it, we've got center map selected. So it's going to zoom in on that particular point. And you can see how frequently it, um, it logs points on the route, on the track log, I should say. So. What you can do is you can see exactly where it's positioned the points. Now there's there's an interesting demonstration there. So it's logged a point there and then it's waited a little while before it logs the next point. So if you look at the route, you see that occasionally it goes off the road. And that's simply because it's joining the points uh, on the basis of the track between between the nodes. So it's just drawing a straight line between the, the points that it's logged. And this is worth bearing in mind when you turn a, um, a track or a, G a GPX file imported as a track into a route. It doesn't necessarily position points directly on the road. Now, in this case, we've because I've recorded this journey on uh, my GPS unit, my, my Garmin Zumo 590, uh, the maps are identical to the ones on the PC. So the points will generally fall in line on the on the map itself, I've found historically. So uh, we could see that that's pretty good. That's pretty reliable. Um, but if we just scroll down to the bottom, you'll see how many points it's logged throughout the course of that journey. 2,838. So there's 2,838 individual points listed there. Now, if we want to turn this into a route, we have an option here, create route. So we just click on that button. Actually, before I do that, let me just demonstrate something. This is another reason why I have direct selected here as the activity profile. If you ordinarily have that selected as an activity such as motorcycle or any other any other activity other than direct when it comes to uh, right clicking on that and create route from selected track or, or we can do it you know double click on it create route from there either, either amounts to the same thing if you do it that way all it will do is it will create a direct route between the two based on its own criteria now it's, that's actually painfully slow, so I'm going to cancel it. All I was going to say is if you set this to direct, you actually get a prompt for how many points. You know, what it was trying to do there was create a route using all those, you know, hundreds and hundreds of points, which is not going to be sensible. If you have that profile set to direct, when you go to um, turn the track into a route, you get this little window pop up. So track conversion options, we can choose the number we can. It says enter the maximum number of via points to create while converting the track to a route. So we can actually pick how many of those points we're going to have. If you convert a, a track with, you know, 1500 points into a route, um, it's just going to look ridiculous. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look ridiculous when you come to view that route on the on the GPS unit. It's effect, it's effectively unmanageable at, at that stage. So if you leave that selected as uh, it's playing the route, stop <laughs> playing the track, sorry. Um, if you leave that select to direct, you can see that we can cut down when we convert this to a route, we can cut down from however many 2838 points we can cut it, we can cut that right down. I have now I have a little rule of thumb here, if you like, I look at the distance on a track and I say, right, okay, it's 165 miles. So what I'm going to plan to do is put a 
point uh, every five miles just based on my own experience that seems to be about right so what we'll do we we'll create route from selected track uh, I'm not going to let it choose the number of points on automatically because you end up in the same position where it creates hundreds and hundreds of points so I'm going to untick that box and on the basis of the distance 165 miles I'm going to yeah, with one every five miles that's going to give us 33 points unless my maths is terrible which it is but let's go with 33 okay so it's converting that track into a route which it's done using 33 points and as you can see it's just positioned the points along the way and it's joined the, the points on the track using the direct profile so it's, it's put it together really quickly as you saw it did it in seconds at this stage you can see that's a far more manageable route and just just with a brief glimpse at the map you can see it's not a million miles off correct so you don't really need that many points when it comes to plotting out a route if there are individual bits we can look at those in a second but if you had to go through 2000 points and check every individual point was correctly aligned to a road it's going to drive you crackers so with that in mind let's look at this so as we discussed in a separate video we've actually we have actually haven't got any waypoints at all on this route we've got um, via points like these these bits in bold and we've got shaping points which are these bits with the won't alert so what you what you want to do is just double check that all these points are actually on the road in the right place and based on what we saw on the track and because we've taken this from a GPS unit which uses the same maps it's likely that they're going to be correctly aligned en route but it's still worth double checking but what I would advi advise us to do first what I would advise you to do first actually is to change the profile now now we've got the the route outline we can pick whichever activity profile we want to use so we'll go with the standard Garmin motorcycling one let it do its thing so it's now going to join those points using its own um, profile and then then it's probably worth at that point looking at the individual points along the route now we've got 33 of them it's not going to take a huge amount of time to go through and just check that they are all on the roads where they're supposed to be so let's just go through them okay and just for the sake of this video I'm going to assume they're all okay uh, based on what what we've seen they look fine uh, what's it doing ah, that's where we stopped somewhere okay yeah so we'll assume they're all okay on that basis now you can see here what's useful now is we can compare the track with the uh, with the route that we've created from the track and we can see that in places it's because we've position things five miles apart it's perhaps chosen a different route from the one we actually want it to, to go down and that's that's easily remedied all we need to do as you've seen in a, a separate video about creating routes is we can add additional points so let's use the pan tool hold down the alt key um, and I'm going to move this point here Sorry, I'm going to add a point, I should say, there. Uh, it looks like it needs another one. Okay, we'll drag another one and we'll put it there. There we go. Sometimes you have to strong arm these things. So that okay, it looks like there was a little tiny stop there for some reason. Probably just pulled over briefly. Yeah, okay, we're not worried about that. We'll just leave that. Um, 
So there, there are the points here when it's gone off the actual route I wanted it to do. So again, Alt key, left click, drag it down to the road. And there we go. So if we open up the the route, you'll find that these those ones we've just added, they'll have slightly different names. And there we go. And in fact, it's created that those as via points. So that was, uh, was that one we added. And then I think that's the one. Yeah. OK. So let's just zoom out. Yeah, that's the one we dropped in there. And it's added them as via points. So you will get audio alerts for those as you approach them. If we don't if we don't want that, as discussed in a separate video, we can say don't alert on arrival and they'll just become normal shaping points. So let's do that actually. So we have we currently have, apart from the first the start point and the end point, uh, which are both via points, all of the others are, are shaping points, so no audio alerts. How are we doing in terms of how that conforms to the original track? Uh, let's just zoom around quickly and you can see that's pretty much there actually. We just got one little bit here. So let's do the whole exercise properly. Let's drag that across there. There we go. So we'll say that's done. There may be other tiny little bits. If you're concerned about it, you could go zoom in. And as I say, I recommend that you go through and check every point. Now, as mentioned, we've got two via points, the start and end, and all the rest in between are shaping points. OK, so what happens now is if we're, if we're traveling along this route at some point and we stop and we break, uh, and we stop the route for any reason. When we recommence that um, that route, it's going to say it's going to say which is the next point along this route you want to go to. And because we only have a start and end point, it would prompt us for either of those. And here's the danger, because if you say if you're uh, at this point in the ride, say. Or even further back, let's say you're here and you stop there and then you and then you restart the ride. You're obviously you're going to say it, when it says which is your next destination on route, you're going to say that one because it's the only one. Uh, well, it, it's not the start. <laughs> it's the only other one available. You're going to say take me to Cotswolds ride 31. Um, unfortunately, what's going to happen at that point is all of these bits here are going to be ignored. OK. So this is this is quite critical. What I would suggest on longer journeys is you take I, I do it on the basis of every fifth um, shaping point I turn into a via point. So I just all you do is say alert on arrival. OK, so five and then we're going to look for ten alert on arrival. Now the beauty of doing it this way and trust me, <laughs> I've learned this the hard way. If you do break your journey, as long as you're, you know in your head which was the last one you passed, well, worst case scenario, you could look on the map actually, but um, you've got a fairly good idea as you're going along, yeah, we've passed the you know, fifth point, the tenth point, the fifteenth point, twentieth point. Um, all you need to do is just remember which one you passed, and then you, when you restart the journey, you could say, right, take me to the next one. And then it will get you back on route subsequent to that. So taking you from where you've stopped to this to the um, via point, it may deviate from the initial route you planned. But subsequent to that, it will conform to this original route that you've planned. If you're super concerned, you could make every single point on the journey a via point and then it would prompt you. But this is, as I say, this is if you're turning a track into a route. Ordinarily with a route, you'd put strategic points in where you want them um, and you're not likely to have names like this you're likely to have more more meaningful names but this works and there are there are reasons uh, and I've done it myself there are reasons you might want to plan a route 
as an ordinary route, turn it to a track and then turn it back to a route again, just so you can set up um, regular points every five miles, for instance. That's a quite nice way of doing it. Or oh, every 25 miles in this case. Okay, so we've dealt with um, importing a track from our own GPS unit. Now, what about if we're using third party tracks? So I've got some nice routes I downloaded from. Um, it was uh, Ride, yes, Ride Magazine's website. They created some tracks and um, made them available. So these are all GPX files. Now, some of them include some of them include routes and waypoints and things. And so if we look at this Grossglockner one, for instance, it's a ride up the uh, Grossglockner in Austria. Very nice place to go. If you haven't gone there, it's worth a trip on a bike. Or oh, a car indeed. Um, so they've actually got that as a driving profile, but uh, it's largely irrelevant. Which profile I suspect. Um, well, we can change it actually. Well, so it's 160 miles according to their route. We could change that to motorcycling. It might make us might make some slight changes based on our preferences. No, yeah, it's actually pretty similar. So, 160 miles probably change the moving time. Yeah, change the time a bit based on our preferences. But it's always worth doing that. Always make sure that you create you use a profile that you yourself have created or one of the ones from your your system anyway. Now, what if you've only got a track from somebody else, so a third party track? Let's go and pick another one of these routes. Uh, the one from Lord has got uh, the associated track in it. So if we can find that. There it is. So we'll import that. This has got the, the actual, like I say, it's got the historic track. Okay, it's also got the, it's also got waypoints and the route there. So, you know, it's got, it's got everything in there. But imagine we, let's, for the sake of this example, let's get rid of all of that. And imagine we've just got, we've just been given a GPX file with just the track. There's no route information or anything. So we can show that on map. That's similar to, as, we, as we've just seen with the GPX file from my, from my sat nav but this is from somebody else's system so we don't know we don't know how this has been generated it might have been generated from a um it might have been generated on a garmin device it might have been generated on a tom tom it could have been generated on a on an app on a phone a anything anything which will do gps track even a you know a camera um the principle's the same so again i'm going to use my convention changes to red and um if we look at these individual points now, I'm going to zoom in a bit actually. I suspect what we're going to find is that some of these points will go off our map because the map uh, where it's placed certain things is almost certainly not going to be in line with roads on our map all of the time. He said trying to find one. Um, okay, it's probably more obvious if we convert it to a route first, so let's do that. So, using the, the method we just went through, let's just do that. Okay, uh, sorry, open. How far is this distance? We just click on there to find out the overall summary. So, 197 miles. Okay, that's fine then. We'll just put... Um, We'll put 40, 40 points along when we convert that into a into a track into a route. Then, so let's do that. Let's create a route. We've got direct selected up here, and we're going to say forty points. So there we go. That's created our route. Yeah, we'll keep that magenta. That's on direct profile at the moment. So as discussed, it's just going to go from point to point in a direct line. Obviously not practical for what we want to do, especially when you get to bits like this. 
So let's change that now to one of our profiles. Let's go motorcycling. Okay, there we go. Right, so straight away at the beginning, I could see already we want to add a slight deviation to get this back on track here. So, pan tool selected, Alt key, left click, drop a point there. Bear in mind, do bear in mind if you're planning routes abroad, uh, in mainland Europe for instance, that uh, if you're dropping points on any dual carriageways, um, autobahn, autoroute, um, autostrade, whatever, then you need to make sure that you drop the point on the correct side of the road, the <laughs> correct carriageway. So obviously the right side, uh, the right hand side, I should say. Okay, let's just zoom in on this. And we're going to go down some of these points and already you can see in some cases this slightly off it's not too bad I suspect that this route was done by somebody with a Garmin because these are actually surprisingly accurate okay now is that a mistake there or is that hmm, looks like they actually did that Okay, well that's fine. We could we could remove that point actually. So let's do that. We don't want that point. It might be irrelevant. Of course, we have to recalculate now. That's another good reason to leave it in direct mode before you've finished checking the points. Otherwise, you have to go through this recalculation and whenever you remove one, it's definitely doing something funky there. Uh, which point was that? that one tell you what let's make that direct I'm just going to remove that it's going to recalculate no it's not it hasn't recalculated that's good so we're just going to go through and check these other points now while it's in direct mode yeah it looks pretty good What you would find in some cases, and I have seen this, unfortunately I haven't got a good example to show you how badly wrong it can go, but occasionally you'll find the track is actually, um, it can be 20 metres to the side of the road for instance, and obviously in those cases it's going to cause you all sorts of trouble unless you first of all make sure the points are actually on the route. So the whole point of this video is just to illustrate that um, you do need to ensure that points, when you convert a track to um, a route, just make extra sure that those points are actually on the road. Yeah, I think this was done on a Garmin. Um, this route is it's actually very good. So in terms of accuracy, I would personally, I would go through every single point, make sure they're in the right place. And then as discussed, earlier uh, every fifth point or so I would I would convert a shaping point to a via point and you know realistically I would probably turn that into a um, a proper waypoint as well at okay, the start and end of the day um, that makes life just a bit easier so right well that's an overview of converting tracks to roots I hope that's proven useful any questions please comment um, if I've missed anything I may do a follow-up video but uh, yeah if something's not clear as with any of this stuff the more you use it the more you ride with it and um, importantly understand how it works in your head um, you'll appreciate it you'll get on better if you don't sort of understand these 
these little foibles about GPS systems. I think that's where people come come and stuck. Um, and I've tried to I've tried to explain this to some people who you know sworn at GPS systems. I try to explain why they do why they've done certain apparently strange things. Uh, there's always a good explanation for it. Um, it's just doing what it's been told to do ultimately. But anyway, uh, yeah, I hope that was useful. And um, if you've enjoyed it, please give it a like. Um, any feedback, welcome. It's difficult to kind of do these things on off the hoof, as it were, but. Um, yeah, hopefully it's more sort of realistic like that. There's a, there's a bit we missed. There, yeah, we could root that up. Anyway, that's enough. I'll uh, I'll finish it there. And um, yeah, hope you enjoyed it.